Good evening, and welcome to this edition of the Speakers and Leaders Hour. I'm Dave Wilkins, your host, and this is the program that comes into your home once a month on the uh, first Tuesday from 7 to 8, and we are here live in the Allen County Public Library, Studio A, and we're here to talk about our two favorite topics, parliamentary procedure and effective communication skills. And those are through the Parliamentary Society and as well as the Toastmasters International Organization. Now, normally what we do is we have our own presenters talk about <laughs> Toastmasters all evening long. But we're going to return tonight to what the Toastmaster program was really all about back in 1924 when Dr. Smedley first formed a Toastmaster club in uh, Santa Ana, California. You see, at that time, he was a uh, director for a YMCA, and in the evening, the young fellows that stayed at the Y would gather in the commons room, and in their casual conversation, one might say, oh, I have a job interview tomorrow, or someone else might say, I have to practice for a test, or I'm giving a presentation to sell a product. In short, they were talking about what they had to do the next day. Dr. Smedley had the idea that if they were to practice those presentations informally in the group that was in the area there and then get advice back on how they did, what they did well, they could indeed uh, improve before they actually went out and did it for the world. Tonight, instead of having just Toastmaster or just parliamentary presentations, we have some guests here. Now, before I introduce the guests, I do want to introduce the members of the panel, and they are on my left side. I believe the camera can probably move around to pick them up, and we'll see who they pick up first. Ah, me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have uh, Tom Haller at the far end, and Tom is a past area governor and member of several Toastmaster clubs and uh, the current president of the Parliamentary Society. And so far, we haven't seen Tom, but we will. And while I'm at it, let me introduce Patricia Kanabi. Patricia is a past division governor. She became past this morning at midnight. And I must say, oh, here we go. There's Patricia right there. Patricia has two very successful years of Toastmastering under her belt as the leader of here of Division B in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, unless we can go back to Tom for just a moment. <clears throat> and I can finish talking about Tom, who is also president of the Parliamentary Society and looks a lot like me. <laughs> uh, in any case, <clears throat> uh, Tom is a good friend and one that has really helped out. There he is. Say hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello. All right. <clears throat> and Tom is a very good Toastmaster and evaluator, and we'll hear some of that a little later on. And last but not least is the lady at the end of the table, and that is Ms. Marlene Purdy, and Marlene is a past District 28 governor over in the beautiful state of Ohio, and Marlene is here tonight not only to uh, <clears throat> evaluate some of the presentations, but talk to us about later on rights and responsibilities of members in a, in a society. So that's the panel, and now it's my pleasure to introduce to you <coughs> the people who will be speaking first. They are members of the Fort Wayne Astronomical Society. <clears throat> it's been in existence since, uh, oh my goodness, uh, 1957, I believe, 1959. And our first speaker will be Chris Hyland. He's been a member since 1984. And he is the observatory director and also a board member. The uh, second presenter tonight will be David Wilkins, a friend of mine, uh, a relative of mine, my son, he joined in 2003. He serves in one of the offices as well as on the board. And they're here tonight to give their presentation that they give to other organizations uh, on how to be better, how to do a good job, and they are here to share with us that information as well as find out what they can do better and what they've done well this evening. So without further ado, please welcome Chris and Dave. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for the introduction. We do have a PowerPoint that's going to start here, I believe, in just a second that we should be able to see on the screen. Again, we are with the Fort Wayne Astronomical Society, and Chris and I are going to talk about a project that we've been working on within the Society for the past couple of years. It's a rather large project. Uh, it has a, a kind of a unique name. It, it's very fitting for an astronomical society. The project is called StarQuest. Could you start us off and tell us a little about it? Well, we've been working on this for many years, and uh, um, we just felt that our existing facility, which we built from scratch, homemade telescope, homemade observatory, uh, was kind of nearing the end of its life, and so we wanted to look ahead towards the future and come up with something that was a little more state-of-the-art, modern, and certainly more versatile. So. so with that, in about 2006, really, we began thinking about it. But before we get too deep into the project itself, we need to tell a little bit about the history. As you had said at the beginning, we were founded in, uh, really, I think, 1957, but incorporated as a nonprofit organization in 1959. So I guess that makes us just about 55 years old now. One of Fort Wayne's best kept secrets, I feel. We are, again, an all volunteer nonprofit organization, and we do have a mission. That is to promote in every way among its members and the general public an interest in and knowledge of astronomy and its allied sciences. That's probably a quote from our bylaws when they were written back then. Uh, but uh, this is kind of some of the things that we actually do as, a, as an organization. Uh, we provide uh, telescopic stargazing sessions uh, for schools, private groups, clubs, other clubs, uh, and of course the general public. Uh, we publish astronomical articles in, in the newspaper and do little TV things and uh, radio spots occasionally. <clears throat> we also collaborate with other organizations in the community uh, as well as nationally, such as Science Central, History Center, and uh, NASA, uh, again, to promote astronomical events and, and exhibits that we've developed ourselves. Um, this is one of the more exciting events that we did uh, recently. Some people may remember this. Uh, there was a, a very unusual type of eclipse, solar eclipse, back in 1994. Um, we were fortunate here in Fort Wayne that this passed right over Fort Wayne. We were in an ideal location to see a perfect ring. Uh, the reason it looks like that is because at this point in, in, in this eclipse, uh, the moon was very far from the Earth, the farthest it can be from the Earth. And so it looked smaller and was unable to completely cover the sun. So you had a ring, a perfect ring of sunlight peeking around the edge of the moon. And that was a very unusual type of eclipse. So I remember that one, although I was not a member yet. Uh, I remember it got almost as dark as night for a little bit. And, and the birds uh, stopped, uh, stopped singing and it got quiet. And kind of a little breeze came up. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very unusual experience. This is still part of that same time? Exactly. The uh, uh, One of the things we did to reach out to the community was to uh, set up many different methods of observing this eclipse safely. Um, not just telescopes, but all kinds of different observing methods. And uh, so down at Fryman Park, we had uh, um, many, many devices and, and uh, our club members set up out there and had hundreds and hundreds of people visit us over the course of the like three and a half hours of the eclipse. I was not down there because I was here at the library with my personal telescope uh, out in the parking lot behind the building, and they ran a cable out and hooked up a video camera to my telescope. And so we broadcast the entire eclipse live um, that day uh, from my telescope. And was, was that still Access Channel 10 at that point? That was point? Channel 10. Channel 10. And, and unfortunately, yeah. I can't stop referring to it as Channel That's 10 right. after That's all these right. years. That's right. <clears throat> this is one of the first events that I came into when I joined the Society, and that was the transit of Venus in 2004. I don't know if it's visible on the screen or not, but at around like the 4 o'clock position on the face of the sun is a little kind of grayish dot. That is the planet Venus moving across the face of the sun, and it's called a transit. It's very similar to an eclipse, really. Mm. It's just so much smaller and further exactly. away that, that it doesn't really cover the whole face of the sun exactly. like the moon would. Even though Venus is much larger than the moon, it's much farther away. So, About eight years later, there was a second transit. And those happen, what, every eight years? Yeah, they come in pairs all the time. So you get one, and then eight years later you get another one, and then you won't have any more for over 100 years. 
uh, and then you'll get another pair. Uh, so, so the next time this will happen is in twenty one twenty five. I think it's twenty one twenty five. Something yeah. like that. And this was a, tele a view taken through a, a larger telescope, a different setup, and it's more obvious that that dark dot is the uh, planet Venus. And you can see a few small sunspots on the uh, surface of the sun, which are not black; they're gray uh, by comparison to the very black uh, Venus. One of the things about the the transit that makes them unique is that they happen during the day. It's one of the rare times we can have the public out during the day. This was at one of our sites? Yeah, we worked uh, the 2012 event. We decided to work in cooperation with the University of St. Francis uh, to uh, set up equipment at two sites. Uh, this was at our observatory site, our current observing site. We had there many more telescopes and, and methods of viewing than you see in this one image. And then the public showed up and uh, when, once the uh, transit got underway. And across town, over at the University of St. Francis, we had another setup uh, selection of equipment and a variety of methods of viewing it safely. And uh, there was hundreds of people observed this event safely with, through our help. One of the things you don't want to try to do without the assistance of an astronomer that knows how to view the sun can be very dangerous exactly. if you're not aware of, of all exactly of, how all to of the do equipment it. we had was perfectly safe. We do a lot, a variety of things for the public. Uh, first and <laughs> foremost, really, we have free public viewing every clear Saturday night between April and November. We also conduct special star parties for schools, organizations, the Boy and Girl Scouts, church groups, private groups. And special events, of course, we just saw two of the events, but also comets, meteor showers, and uh, related type of, of um, phenomena. <laughs> yeah. Um, back when I first joined the organization, uh, we were located at Fox Island County Park. Um, that's uh, not our original facility, but uh, we moved into the park in around 1979, <laughs> and uh, that's where most people in the community remember us. We were there for about 33 years uh, altogether, so, uh, and uh, it had some advantages. We did many types of events there, lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, comets, Halley's Comet, so a lot of people came out to see those types of events with our help at uh, Fox Island. When we first moved out there back in, this is before we moved out there in 78, we were thinking about it, um, you can see that uh, it was basically a pretty good horizon. Uh, the green trees off in the distance there are Christmas trees that were never harvested. Uh, the entire farm was a Christmas tree farm, uh, but once they stopped harvesting them, they just continued to grow. So right in the center of the image is where we erected a, a 10 foot mound and installed our homemade observatory, which we moved from across town. Uh, on top of that little hill. And after, of course, uh, you know, approximately 30 years, <clears throat> trees grow. And uh, so now we're uh, suffocating. <laughs> the picture was taken from the exact same vantage point as it had been 30 years earlier. And uh, the uh, you can see the little observatory there on top of a short, well, now it looks short, 10-foot hill. We, we had great view of trees near the end there. Yeah, it wasn't bad initially, but it gradually got worse as time went on. So we, we did make it all the way through the 2011 viewing season before we moved. Exactly. But... Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't miss a beat. Uh, we planned to relocate to another part of the county and uh, and move our equipment and so forth. So we didn't actually skip a beat. Uh, we did it over the winter when we're closed. This was our original telescope. Uh, this telescope was handmade uh, by our founding club members. Um, it's a reflecting telescope. It uses a mirror at the bottom of the tube at the lower right, and uh, that's a chunk of glass, 12 and a half inches in diameter and two inches thick and uh, weighs about 20 pounds, and it's precisely curved to a few millionths of an inch to concentrate the starlight up towards the front of the tube where you look through an eyepiece. Uh, the dome was also made by hand, and it was motorized. The dome could turn with a little washing machine motor under the floor. So uh, that, that scope did a great job for us for about 45 years, as did the facility, the dome itself. It was a very unique design. But it really, it did become time to, to try something new, and that's when StarQuest was formed, which was really to assess what we had done in the first 50 years. Again, this was about 2006, and we could see that we had the 50-year celebration coming up in 2009. We also wanted to plan and design upgrades to our programs, facilities, equipment, location, really to be the best we could be for the community that we serve. So our goal became, out of that, <clears throat> excuse me, it was to build and operate a new observatory by April of 2015. 
Uh, to that end, uh, we announced at uh, one of our meetings in 2008, <coughs> just to our club members, that all the teams and committees that we had formed and researched what type of facility, what type of new equipment we might be interested in, and this was the type of telescope we were interested in purchasing. And fortunately, uh, one of our club members who had just joined that evening volunteered to donate the funds for the scope. And so immediately we were able to purchase that and install it the following spring without, again, missing a beat in operation. Uh, it's, uh, the telescope is made by a company called Mead. Uh, instead of a 12 and a half inch mirror, it uses a 16 inch diameter mirror, which gathers about 64% more light. But the main advantage of this particular scope is that it's fully automated, it's fully computerized, motorized. You don't even touch it. You just tell it what you want to look at and it goes to any one of 180,000 objects. Um, so it's a very, very capable instrument and it's extremely efficient. Um, this is an example of uh, some of the tele or an image of the moon that was taken through our telescope, I believe, shortly after we got it. Yeah, within that first year <clears throat> of being installed, that, that picture was taken. The, the StarQuest project really <clears throat> had three issues to address. The one was the deterioration of the old observatory dome being built out of plywood and two-by-fours and sitting out in the middle of woods for 45 years. The wood was rotting. It, it was literally falling apart around us. We also had the obstruction of the horizon, as was seen with the trees. And then just the whole southwest side of Allen County is really seeing huge growth of the economy, which is awesome. But it's not so good for astronomy. You get a lot of light pollution. It really limits what's available to the eye. So those were the three things that we really wanted to address as we moved forward with that new scope and building a new observatory. So to find us, number one, we addressed the, the location. We've moved to the other side of New Haven. It's just outside the loop of uh, 469, maybe three or four miles out from mm -hmm. there, on uh, Dawkins Road, which I think is old 14. Yep. And it's just past a depot. What's the name of that? Uh, well, most people know it as the Cassad Depot. It's, yeah. uh, I think it's called the um, National Logistics <laughs> Storehouse or something or other because they used to store strategic materials there. And, uh, but it's, it's all shut down now waiting for development. But uh, we're just beyond that in a park that's actually existed for 40 years out there. Um, this, uh, this location is called Jefferson Township Park. And uh, it has the first benefit it offered to us was a greatly improved horizon. That uh, that long skinny image is actually a 360 degree panorama. Uh, the center of the image is looking due south. The left edge is looking due north, and so is the right edge. Uh, in fact, if you look really closely, there's the front half of the Mini Cooper on one side and the back half on the other side. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the due east and west directions are kind of like halfway between the center and the edge on each side. So we really have an excellent horizon. It's, it's uh, like one-fifth as high as it was out of Fox Island. Uh, in addition, the skies are much darker. There's ver very little development around us. And uh, access is excellent with 469 being uh, close at hand. At Fox Island, it was uh, I-69 was right close by. Um, we're very also fortunate that there are four other nonprofit organizations uh, in the vicinity that uh, we can work with and combined we can draw people's attention out to the park. Uh, one is the Maumee Valley Antique Steam and Gas Association. Uh, they have a tractor show in August every year, which draws thousands of people. Uh, the Flying Circuits are a radio-controlled model airfield. They have a very nice paved runway, uh, blacksmiths, and a lot of people may remember the old 765 steam locomotive. Uh, that's owned by the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society. So we like to think of this as a really nice nonprofit campus out there. Here's an image of what the new observatory is going to look like. And it has to scale the little dome as an inset there. The new one is, uh, what, about 40 feet across? Uh, when the building is, uh, is closed, we, we retract the uh, roof sections when we're closed, and it gets to be about 40 feet wide. But in, its, in the image there, it's more like 80. Uh, those two flat roof panels actually roll to the center when we're not using the building. And when we do want to observe, we just roll them aside. Um, it has uh, many advantages uh, over our uh, uh, previous observatory. And uh, here's a few of those. Uh, one is that the large observing room can handle multiple telescopes simultaneously. In a dome, because there's only just one little slit in the roof, 
you can only have one telescope looking in one direction at a time. So now we can have multiple scopes in operation. Um, this building will be totally accessible for uh, people with disabilities. Our previous observatory was not. Uh, we intend to be connected to the internet so we can get, uh, uh, we can broadcast astronomical activities from within the dome out to the public, or if we're having an event there, we can observe an event that's occurring somewhere else in the world. Um, it also has a climate controlled library for storing equipment. In addition, we can now see all of the planets. I had never seen Mercury from Jefferson, uh, from Fox Island, mm -hmm. because it never got high enough on the horizon to be able to see it. Now that's available to us. Likewise, all of the winter constellations, such as Orion, uh, Sagittarius in the south, the various galaxies, nebula, clusters, comets, meteors, <laughs> etc. What's been amazing is the amount of community support that we've had through the whole thing. Number one, I would say, has been media coverage. That has really helped us get exposure Excellent. to become less of a hidden treasure and more awareness that, number one, we've moved, and two, we're still in existence. Yeah. Also, where we're at now, we're actually part of the National Park Service. They approve of our activities, and Jefferson Township Park sits on national federal land. We've also had support from foundations, businesses. I think every university in the state of or in the city of Indiana, has, or exactly. of Fort Wayne, has helped us. We serve Indiana Tech, Ivy Tech, IPFW uh, t multiple times a year. They send their students out to us. And then the public enthusiasm has just been phenomenal. So that's a little bit about the StarQuest project. If you would like to learn more about what we do, simply visit the Fort Wayne Astronomical Society com. And with that, I would like to return control to the leader for the evening. We appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoyed the program. Come, come see us. No problem. Thank you, David. Very interesting. Um, many, many years ago, my dad and I were part of the early group that was the Astronomy Society, and the, the 16 and a half inch mirror was actually ground at uh, Buick, on uh, Kelly Buick there on South Calhoun Street. They had a garage set aside. Wow. And the initial glass was set on top of a 55-gallon drum. And we walked in a circle around it with gritty paper going like this, mm -hmm. sanding it to make it a concave mirror. So I had a little bit of a hand in doing that a long, long time ago. <clears throat> Well, I, I think you guys did great, but now let's just kind of find out what the Toastmasters thought. Tom, could you start, and what did you think? Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I was not familiar with the society at all. I didn't know we had such a society. So it was very informative for me. Obviously, you put on a lot of presentations. It was not anything new to you. So there definitely was a level of sophistication that might not be available to the average person. Just under the heading of things to improve, you, Chris, have a lot of ahs in your speeches. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I was nervous. <laughs> That's something you would work on in Toastmasters, and we'd, sure. we'd cure you that in no time. Yeah. You also, some of the time you were just fine, some of the time you had repetitious gestures. You had your hands mm -hmm. from you like this. Yeah. I take it that uh, either through instruction or just inheritance, your son did not have so many of those, <laughs> those gestures. <laughs> a couple of things that were just very uh, intriguing to me having you know, no experience or information in this area at all, I wondered why it was unsafe. I take it it would be dam to look at it wrong. I take it it would be damaging to your Blindness. eyesight. To the right. of the summit. Yes. Yeah. The summit like instant. Instant. Yeah. Without the safe filters, you can't look at the sun through the telescope. Yeah. It's, it's instantly blind. Yeah, we, there might be something when you're making your presentation to make crystal clear because that could mm. be of almost you know, <coughs> unimaginable importance to somebody. Exactly. And I never thought about there being a viewing season. Why is there a viewing season? It's not so much because of the sky. It's more because of people's comfort levels. Because in order to use the most instruments, telescopes that we use, uh, the instrument needs to be at the same temperature as the outside air. So if it's uh, cold outside, the telescope needs to be cold. If you're standing there using it, you're going to be cold. So for the comfort of our visitors, we shut down in December and then reopen again. It's, it's 
more just a um, convenience thing, you know, so people aren't standing out there freezing. But because of the new horizon we have, we're able to see all of the winter constellations before we close for the winter, and then again in the spring when we open. So we don't actually have to be open during the dead of winter. Okay. Well, this is certainly one thing I've enjoyed about Toastmasters is learning about new things. I don't suppose I would have ever heard about this otherwise, and I'm very glad you've heard about it. And you guys, you know, don't take my suggestions the wrong way. You've done an excellent job. You're already top-notch presenters. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, Patricia? I really don't have a whole lot to add to what Tom said. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. I learned a lot from it. I also was not aware that you were a society that we had in Fort Wayne. Uh, again, I did notice some filler words, and as Tom said, that's something that Toastmasters can cure. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And, uh, and Marvin? I noticed, <coughs> made notes here that very pleasant speaking voices. The tone, the pace, the clarity, the enunciation, right on. I thought there were appropriate gestures, at least at the beginning. I, I didn't pay that much attention, but you had some very appropriate gestures at the beginning. The visuals were outstanding, and you referred to them appropriately. Very organized, very good information. I had one suggestion. You have those things up there, and I don't know what they are. And <laughs> you didn't explain them to <laughs> us. <laughs> That's, true. That's a, a mini version of what you would look through if you go out to the observatory. Okay, and oh. what's this? Uh, well, the one on the, the, the one that has a black tube, mm -hmm. it has a mirror on the inside of it. Don't okay. You? Whereas this one is more of like the pirate ship style where you look in one end okay. and, and out the other. Okay, that was so the only one thing. one is mirror based in the other That's side. the only thing I missed. I thought, oh, I'm going to learn all yeah. about those. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> nothing happened. And I've seen presentations to do that too. There's something interesting on the table, but they never address it. And but then they forgot. That is to keep you. But the presenta your presentation skills are excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, fellows, for presenting tonight. That was wonderful. And now we're going to go into a presentation from Patricia Canavi, and she's going to do an editorial. And I believe the editorial is, is three to five minutes? Three to five minutes. Okay. Can you come and do that? Sure. All right. Let's get Patricia. <laughs> Yes, I do. Thank okay. you so much. Be very okay. careful. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, most honored guests, and our guests at home. We just came to the close of a year, a, an excellent year for Toastmasters, especially in Division B and District 11. <clears throat> Last Saturday, we had officers training, and we trained a number of officers from the area clubs. And I was facilitating the breakout session that dealt with the VP of membership and the VP of public relations for each club. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat, I apologize. <clears throat> and one thing that came out of the breakout session was the importance of our guests at our meetings. Guests become members. Thank you, Tom. Having said that, we must, as Toastmasters, treat our guests as if they are guests in our home. When they come into our meetings, we must treat them warmly, greet them warmly, shake their hand, give them a name tag, introduce ourselves to them, a guest packet with all types of information inside, including an application and a Toastmasters magazine. We want to make sure that our guests leave with all of the information they have to make an educated decision about our club and about the Toastmasters organization. What is important here is that all guests leave with a positive impression of Toastmasters. That guest may not come back to our club. That guest may go to another club and join. 
or that guest may leave and not become a, a Toastmaster for 5, 10, or 15 years, depending on what their schedule is. For example, we have many college students who come to visit us, and they are required to visit a Toastmasters meeting for a communications class. We see them once or twice. We don't see them again. However, if we leave them with a good impression, they may become Toastmasters in the future. All of you who are watching and all of you who are thinking of joining Toastmasters, <clears throat> think about how you feel if you walk into a setting and you are ignored or you are treated poorly or you are not given a warm welcome. Think about how many people you tell about that negative experience. And we did talk about this on Saturday at Officers Training. We as human beings typically tell about 10 people about a negative experience. Think about when you walk into a warm, welcoming environment and you come away with a positive feeling and you're excited about the opportunity that's been presented to you. How many people do you tell? Typically we tell two, three, maybe four. The impact that we make on our guests as Toastmasters is paramount to the success of our clubs. We need to make that positive impact on our guests. As I said, they may not become members today. They may not become members for a year. They may not join our club, but they may join a club. And it is our responsibility as good stewards to the Toastmaster brand and the Toastmaster name to make our guests feel as welcome and as warm as we would want to feel coming into a club where we have never visited before. So that is my mission for all Toastmasters who are watching. When you have guests at your club, welcome them warmly, shake their hand, ask them to sign the guest book, give them a guest packet, invite them to become a Toastmaster. Master Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Patricia. Toastmasters is one of the few organizations I know of that takes such pride and has such a need for audience and member participation for it to be a success. And as you so aptly pointed out, the only way we get new members is if we have guests coming in. And I think at Anthony Wayne, we, we, I think we ambush them. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's over there ready to shake their hand and get their name and tell them who they are and then warn them there'll be a quiz at the end on who's who. <laughs> anyway, this is the first half of the program, and we like to divide this program into two sections, the speakers and leaders hour. And this has been the speakers portion of the program. And so we'll take a little bit of a break, and when we come back, we will highlight the uh, leadership portion of it or the parliamentary portion of it. So... We'll take a little break right now. Thank you very much. And now for our next speaker, Stanley Glitchner. Speaking in public doesn't have to be a death sentence. At Toastmasters, we can help you overcome your fears. I'd like to begin uh, tonight with a uh, little joke. Uh, this guy, he's a farmer. He says, hey. Hello? Sorry. But see, seriously, folks. Um, uh, Speaking in public is no joke. Doc, farmer says, a uh, doctor says, f chicken says, for help. Call Toastmasters, the public speaking support group. The chicken. All the education in the world won't help you get ahead in life if you can't express your ideas effectively. Every day, competition for advancement gets tougher and tougher. You need an edge. A Toastmasters club can give you that edge. A low-cost learning experience for men and women. 
Toastmasters gives you the confidence to express your ideas to anyone. Get the Toastmasters edge. What future do you envision for yourself? What dreams do you have? If you want your dreams to come true, you must have confidence in yourself and your abilities. A Toastmasters Club can help you build that confidence. A low-cost learning experience for men and women, Toastmasters shows you how to express yourself clearly and effectively. Make your dreams a reality. Join a Toastmasters Club. And we are back with the second half of the program, the uh, parliamentary half. And now this is the half where we highlight Robert's Rules of Order and what his rules mean and where they came from and why we have them. A little later we're going to hear a presentation on the history of parliamentary procedure. But right now we're going to hear from a young lady who we always hear about our rights, our rights, our rights. But are you a responsible member? Let's welcome Marlene Purdy with, are you a responsible member of your organization? Marlene Purdy. Thank you, Dave. We just heard from an organization that I assume would like new members. And Toastmasters is always recruiting new members. Those people that they think would benefit from the organization and I'm sure there are many many other organizations out there with the same particular issue but are you going to be a good member of that organization well first of all let's talk a little bit about the rights of a member so that you can be a good member number one every member has a right to play an active and contributing part in his or her organization now, I know there are many times people who are what we call paper members, people whose name's on the book because they, they believe in the organization, but they're not actually part of the organization. And so every member has a right to participate. Regarding membership dues and voting rights, if there are dues, you need to pay those dues. You need to abide by the rules of the organization and fulfill any other obligations of that organization. Did you realize that when your dues are unpaid, you're still legally allowed to vote until such time that you are formally dropped from the membership or unless the bylaws of the organization specifically provide for special assessments. Otherwise, they cannot be assessed additional fees. You have a right to attend all the meetings, to make motions, and to vote. And they have a right to attend all the meetings of the group. Compulsory attendance rules valid only if written into the bylaws. I know some organizations <coughs> haven't written into the bylaws that if you miss two meetings, you're automatically dropped. If that's in the bylaws, then that holds. But otherwise, you have a right to attend meetings as long as as much as or as little as you want. <coughs> Members have a right to attend and any member has the right to request an opportunity to appear before a committee which is considering a matter of which he or she has a special interest. I don't know if you're aware of it, but most organizations, committee meetings are closed and according to Robert's Rules of Order, meetings, committee meetings are open only to those people who are members of the committee or others who have been invited. Now, if you think a committee is meeting on something that you're very interested in, then you would probably request attending that meeting. You can make and second motions, and unless 
debate is prohibited by the rules or has been limited by a two-thirds vote of the members present and voting, you have a right to discuss the merits of a motion. You have a right to ask questions and a right to vote. And voting is part of the membership. A member cannot be forced to vote should, and should abstain on questions in which he has a direct interest. Now, I know that Indiana government doesn't always follow those <laughs> rules. I, that's a bugaboo about mine. I'm sorry. I know in many cases people at the state level have participated in things that they had a financial interest in and little red flags go up and I about have a coronary over it. And you have the right to vote for yourself for office. If there's an election, you can vote for yourself. And I think back when I was in high school, and actually no, it was, I think it was junior high, back then my, I'd been taught you never vote for yourself. And it cost me being a cheerleader because I did not vote for myself and a first place vote would have been worth four and I lost by one. So if I had voted for myself, I'd have been the cheerleader in my seventh grade year. I have never forgotten that. <laughs> and you have a right, you have no right to explain your vote. In other words, if you vote, you vote. You don't say, because of this, 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 and this is why I vote. And I know in Congress and in legislatures, they do that all the time. And you can change your vote up until the time the results are announced. After the results are announced, can, you can only change your vote with the permission of the assembly. And if a member doubts the results of the vote, they can demand verification by calling for division of the House. And in that case, then there is another type of voting, either a standing vote count or something that will take place. Normally in debate, a speaker can speak no more than twice on the same question on the same day and cannot speak a second time on an item so long as another is requesting recognition to speak. And usually the amount of debate time is limited. And the maker of the motion has the right to vote or speak first. In other words, if you make a motion in a group and they are ready for discussion, you, as the maker of the motion, have the right to speak first, and all comments must be limited to the merits of the subject. In other words, you can't go off in right field or left field and bring up something totally unrelated. It has to be, has to be germane to the topic. All remarks are addressed through the chair. Now, you guys can't get into a separate discussion on something that's going on in the meeting. Like, if you think one thing and you, th and you start an argument, if you want to debate what he says, then you have to address it to the chair, and then the chair will share it with the audience, and that's the way debates are held. And personal remarks <coughs> should be avoided. <laughs> Members are seldom referred to by name. Officers are referred to by title. And members should be seated when another member is given the floor and during any interruption by the presiding officer. In other words, you can't just jump up and start talking. You have to wait to be addressed. And a member may not speak against his own motion. However, he may vote against it. In other words, you don't have to vote for your motion, but you cannot speak against it. And there are a whole list of other options. So now we've talked about your rights. Now let's go back and talk about your responsibilities. If you are a member of an organization, there are certain things that to be a good member you really need to follow. You need to respect and abide by the objects, policies, and manner of operation found in such documents as the bylaws and standing rules. In other words, if this is what the group stands for, if you want to change them, then you need to bring up, go through the procedure to get them changed. But in the meantime, you follow the rules of the organization. You pay your dues promptly. You hold office if elected. Some people say, oh, I don't want to be an officer. Well, sometimes it's your responsibility to take an office or to serve on a committee. Attend and participate in meetings. Again, don't be a paper member. Be on time so the president can begin on time. Nothing it irks me more than to have people straggling in at the end of meetings. 
Pay attention and don't carry on private conversations. Address all remarks to the chair, which I mentioned earlier. Make motions and start with the word, I move. How many times do you sit in a meeting, I make a motion, or I think we ought to do this. If you want to make a motion, I move. Be the first to speak to a motion that you've made. Talk loudly enough to be heard. Discuss only immediately pending questions. We talked about that earlier. Know what you're voting on, and if, you're not clear, if it's not clear, ask. Vote on motions. Take an interest in what's happening. Accept amendments if you agree with them. Sit near the front if you have a report to make. Don't sit in the back of the room and then make a grand entrance up to the front to do your report. Move the adoption of recommendations in your report if action is required. In other words, if you give a committee report and there's some action necessary, then you would report it from the committee, which doesn't need a second, by the way. And move to delimit debate if discussion becomes repetitions. Move to stop debate if there is too much re repetitious discussion. Help get the pending question off the floor by moving to do something, whether refer it to a committee or whatever. Be an effective part of the meeting planning team. If you're going to bring something up in the meeting, advise the president so they know ahead of time and they don't get blindsided. Be alert to what appears to be an incorrect procedure by saying, I rise to a point of order or I rise to a point of information. Be sensitive to the feelings of your fellow members. Credit them with the best possible motives or actions. If you follow these young people, you probably will be a very, very valued member of the organization. And that goes for you out in TV land as well. Mr. Host. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much, Marlene. <clears throat> I didn't mention this earlier, but this is indeed a live interactive call-in show. If you have comments or you'd like to reach us here, we are at 422-3902. We have operators standing by. And if you perhaps know one of us on the panel or have a question about Toastmasters, the Parliamentary Society, or the Fort Wade Astronomical Society, we would love to hear from you at this time. Until then, we are going to now have a presentation that, talk of, that talks about the history of Robert's Rules of Order and where it actually came from. So, and so to do that, we're going to have the president of the uh, local parliamentary chapter, Mr. Tom Haller, to do that for us at this time. Tom? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Wilkins. Appreciate it. I'm going to take a little liberty. That's one thing you can do when you have control of the lectern. <laughs> Unless there are large people menacing you with hooks and so forth, you have a tendency to be able to do whatever you want. I suspect that the average person watching does not realize the debt that Toastmasters owes to these two fine women on my left. Marlene Purdy, who just stepped down, was the <clears throat> last year's Division A governor. For those of you who don't understand, that means that she drove to the other side of the state time and time and time again. And she helped them get reorganized and get on the right path to such an extent that she is, that her division is now a distinguished division, which is very important in Toastmaster world. <laughs> so indeed, around the applause. And she did not need this in her life. She's been a district governor. She has been there. She's done that. This was not part of her bucket list, I'm sure. <laughs> the other young lady, <coughs> Patricia Canabi, <clears throat> I've had the very great privilege of working with her for the past two years, and she has also done very wonderful things for this Division B. This would be this area here. And she had probably the most successful presentation at our last training session in Indianapolis that they ever had. I don't know that for sure, but they had no way to seat all the people that were in there. We had standing room only. And she has really done an excellent job, a hard worker, very capable person. So she, too, deserves your maximum show of appreciation. Thank you. Now, as to the <clears throat> history of parliamentary procedure, I think we will concentrate just primarily on the English portion of this. Most of our laws and so forth come from English common law. 
Likewise, most of our parliamentary procedure has the same history. This is rather important. English, eventually we had to separate from the English, wasn't <coughs> working out anymore. Nonetheless, we do owe them a substantial debt of gratitude. For example, many countries do not have the presumption of innocence if you're on trial. And many civilized countries do, do not for a minute assume that you are <coughs> you know, innocent when the trial starts. A number of countries, if the police get some evidence in an illegal way, they can still present it. They themselves may be in trouble. They may become the new criminal for having done this, but that evidence can be used against you. So there are some very important things that we have the English to thank for and what they taught us. The late 1500s, early 1600s, was a time of dynamic change in Toastmasters, in not in Toastmasters, but in parliamentary procedure for several centuries ahead of Toastmasters. This was a time period when many of the basic rules and assumptions that we operate under came to pass. For example, before, oh, I think it was 1570-some, you could not, it was not against the rules to have two main motions on the floor at the same time, or even more if the mood struck you. I mean, can you imagine the chaos of that? Is that not just absolutely asinine? We consider that so obvious that it's ridiculous to talk about it, but that was not always the case. As you know, every few years, there was some major distinction come up that changed things. About that time became the rule that you had to have a negative vote. You had to have a complete affirmative and then a negative vote. I suspect there are even today organizations, if it becomes obvious that the affirmative vote is going to succeed, they just drop the matter there. No, 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 no. You have to have both sides of this. <clears throat> Before that, you could not divide a motion in two. There could be two separate parts to a motion, some that people would favor and some they would be against. Nowadays, you can, if it's appropriate, divide that <clears throat> excuse me, motion into two and them separately. It did not inherently happen. It was piecemeal by piecemeal, and it was hard work. Much, much debate went on. The situation in England was changing at that time. Gradually, the kings ruled less and less. If you have an absolute monarch, there's not a whole lot of need for parliamentary procedure because what he says or she is going to go. That's what you're going to do. It doesn't matter if everybody else in the room is against you, is against the idea. So little by little as this changed, parliamentary procedure changed. So we do owe the British you know, a substantial debt of gratitude in this regard. When it came over to the United States, or should I say to the colonies before we became the United States, they just naturally went along with what had been done in England before, starting with the very first legislature, the House of Burgess in Virginia, they followed these procedures. As late as Thomas Jefferson's uh, time as president, things were very, very rowdy in Congress. People were talking, spitting. Time and again you see this. No spitting. Stop with the spitting already. <laughs> Along with anybody want to be around someone who was spitting at them. They did that. It's, anyway, the point is, step by step, civilization has come to bear through the use of parliamentary procedure to make it what it is today. And if it's obeyed today, you have a very great parliamentary program which will guide your meetings to a safe and fair conclusion. And on that note, I will return control to our leader, Dave Wilkins. Help me welcome Dave back. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> to continue on with just a little bit more information about parliamentary procedure, we might talk about Henry Robert, uh, the gentleman that wrote Robert's Rules of Order, and that is this book that is right here. This, of course, is the most current edition, the 11th edition. And if you want to know everything about leading a meeting, just memorize this. <laughs> And I'd like to tell you that I've read this, but I ain't. And I have not. I have <laughs> found what I needed when I needed it, and that's the way I used it. So, But it was written by Henry Robert in 1876. 
And when Toastmaster was formed about oh, 35 years later, in 1924, the founder of Toastmasters wanted people to be able to speak effectively, but not only that, but be able to lead a meeting effectively. So the founder of Toastmasters glommed on to and picked up Robert's rules and said, these will be the rules how we conduct our meetings here in Toastmasters. And lo and behold, in the early 1950s, uh, Ralph Smedley, the founder of Toastmasters, decided to read up on the history and the biography of Henry Robert. And there was no such thing. And he actually set about spending his time and his dollars on putting together a history of Henry Robert. So, in fact, the history of Robert's Rules of Order and the biography of the man that did it was written by the founder of Toastmasters. So you can see that there is an inner connection back and forth between the two organizations. And indeed, here in Fort Wayne, we do have a parliamentary society that I will tell you meets on the third Monday of the month right here in the library, and that is in the globe room just down the line from here. The globe room is behind the, the big globe. Ooh, okay. <laughs> 6 to 8.30 on third Mondays. I also want to say some thank yous this evening. I have been kind of remiss in this lately. Our camera operators have been Don Rizwan and Robert Boyd, both of Anthony Wayne Toastmasters. Thank you, folks. You are doing a great job tonight. <clears throat> we have an intern working in the audio department. His name is Sasha Parrish-ish, and he has done a wonderful job with the audio. Our technical directing has been shared between Jim Mount and uh, Miss Elizabeth Lord. We also need to thank Allen County Public Library and Access Fort Wayne for the facilities to do this wonderful TV show once a month. In fact, if you have an idea for a TV show or you'd like to be a presenting here on television, all you need to do is come up with an idea, make a telephone call to Access Fort Wayne, and they will put you in touch with just the exact right person to tell you how you can go about doing your own television show. And it's free, F-R-E-E, free. So that's something to remember. And speaking of free television shows, our next one here will be on August 4th, and it will be here at 7 o'clock in the evening, and we will have Toastmasters. Maybe we'll have another group like the, the Astronomy Society. And speaking of, I want to thank uh, uh, Chris <coughs> Hyland and David Wilkins for being here tonight. Give them a nice hand. <laughs> very interesting presentation. I think you should be able to present that just about anywhere and be very proud of it. And the, the regulars on this show, Mr. Tom Haller, who has been such an invaluable help. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Patricia Kanabi always adds an air of elegance and thinness to the program. Thank you for being here, Patricia. And the world traveler who makes it here every now and again is our own Marlene Purdy. Thank you for being here, Marlene. Thank you. And folks, thank you for at home for watching. This has been a really fun evening to be a part of your lives for this hour. And until next time, may all your meetings be fair and efficient, and your meetings run fair and free for communication, speaking, reading, and communicating. Good night.